Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Wood. I'm the Special Projects Manager for Early Music America, and we want to thank you for joining us for the December free webinar. Uh, we've been offering one of these every month since September, and we're happy that you've joined us once again. If you haven't had a chance to view uh, the previous webinars, you can find those on our YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash EMA Early Music America. We will have this evening's webinar also listed there within the next few days. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email to everyone who is registered here uh, with the slides and the images that you'll be seeing during the presentation. A couple of uh, housekeeping sort of issues. Uh, if you are participating via Zoom, uh, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function. And if you're using a, a, a desktop or an app that's a little bit uh, uh, bigger, I think tablets have it also, you can just click on Q&A, uh, which is in the toolbar and then you can submit your questions there and we'll address those as we can throughout the webinar itself. Uh, if you are joining us via Facebook Live right now, you can submit your questions in the comments and we'll try to get to those as quickly as we can uh, as well. Uh, this evening we have uh, the first of our webinars that is focused more on uh, the performance side of it. We have special guests with us this evening from the USC Thornton School of Music, Adam Knight Gilbert, who uh, has uh, worked this, this uh, workshop uh, and this uh, presentation uh, uh, over, over many years. And uh, you'll be seeing the current iteration, I suppose, of this, uh, of this presentation. And hopefully you'll be uh, in, well informed. And you can come back to it, like I said, by uh, viewing it on our YouTube channel if you ever want to see something once again. Uh, so that's all that you need to hear from me. I'm going to turn this over to uh, to Adam now, and uh, we will continue. So if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A. Adam, it's up to you. Hi there, everybody. Let's see, something, okay, I'm, I can't see myself because you've stopped me. Nobody, I can't see me. You just, hey. you, should, you just click start video on yours. You should be okay. And it says because the host has stopped it. Oh, that's okay, here we go. Uh, well, here I am. <laughs> you coming? Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming and tuning in. Um, we're always fix the glitches every second, right? Um, well, while we're doing this, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? They can't say yes, but we, we can <laughs> figure out, right? Are we supposed to be seeing a video right now is a question coming from the folks. And the uh, answer is not, yes, yeah, soon. <laughs> okay, yeah. start my video. Um, Great, I can hear you, but I can't see you, Donna, but now you can see me, I hope. And so here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and just start chatting away. And um, I wanna, first of all, thank Early Music America and especially David for doing such a great job of making these happen. Um, he is our uh, Hephaestus, our Vulcan, our, we're making everything run, it's wonderful. Okay, so um, usually when I do this presentation, um, I am in a classroom with people in a circle and we all improvise, people go around a circle with different people trying. We won't be able to do that tonight so much. So I thought I'd sort of do, go through the steps that I do with the class when I do that, but also talk a little bit about the history. And so the, this is named um, Thunder into the Tune of Green Sleeves. And that's because it comes from a quote from Falstaff, let it sky rain potatoes and thunder to the tune of green sleeves. Well, it turns out green sleeves is one of the most common uh, four chord progressions that people improvised over, sang over, did all kinds of things in, throughout the Renaissance and into the Baroque. So just in case you don't know a ground or a ground bass, a ground could be anything. It could be something, a melody, a pattern over which you make diminutions or variations or divisions. A bass or basso or a ground bass typically refers to something we think of as a chord progression. Um, this is really um, one of the things I'll talk about tonight is that it's not just a chord progression, it's actually something else in addition. Another word for this was a tenor. Um, Passamezzo refers to the term a step and a half, a dance step. Um, Romanesca is a term that became associated with the same chord progression as green sleeves. We'll talk about that. 
Some ground-based tunes are just called arias or airs. And you know, you think about opera aria that where the lady stops to sing, right? Um, actually, the word air and aria originally means dance because in the early operas, people actually stop to sing over a dance pattern, often a ground-based progression. So I'll just um, start from the beginning and just say that there are three kinds of grounds. And if this doesn't make sense to you now, I trust me, it will make sense later. There are grounds that have an open ending, like a question. And there are grounds that, so if you look at the Pasakalia here, if you go. It's going from a one and it's always going to five. That's kind of an, oh, it's an open ending. And that's a term that goes back to the Middle Ages. On the other hand, there's some that just have closed endings, which is. One, four, five, one, one, four, five, one. That's the kind of ground, the canario, that just has answers. And then there are grounds that have a question followed by an answer, an open ending followed by a closed ending. These include the chacona, bum, 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 or the passamezzo Romanesco, bing, bum, 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 question, answer. I hope you can hear that. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, by the way, the word close is actually the original word for what we now call cadence, the fancy term for it in Latin is clausula. And basically, the Romanesca and the ground-based progression, the very first ones are really just two cadences put together. If you see here, I have this pattern here. Yum, bum, bum, bum. That's a typical, what we now call a Phrygian cadence. In the 15th century, la, sol, fa, mi, a cadence on me, versus la, sol, fa, mi, re. And then the difference between these two, the antico and the Romanesca, is actually nobody ever called it the antico pattern until they invented something they called the moderno pattern, right? But here's the problem. If you yum, bum, 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 you see this G down here to the F, it causes a parallel fifth between these voices. The way they orig avoided it originally was dropping down to the octave and coming back up to the five. But the Romanesca pattern is based on something else where you have a three below the tenor and then a five below the tenor, a three below the tenor and a five below the tenor. That progression avoids the parallel fifths. And that's what makes Romanesca so great because I can have a melody that has no parallel fifths. The older pattern has some issues. We'll talk about that a little more as we go. Okay. Too much information to start with, but here's what, why this is important. Greensleeves, Romanesca, actually grows out of two chord progressions. And this is um, two cadences. And so if you look at the pattern that says tenor melody in front of you, it really just has five, four, three, two, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Uh, Adam, we need you, I think we need you to share your screen. Oh, my screen not shared? Okay, well, let's, now you guys are wanting me to like actually do this properly. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so here we go. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, well, we'll come back to the other picture later if you need. But the point about this is that anybody looking at these, this pattern would see that the first four measures, bom, la, sol, fa, mi, are typical Phrygian cadence. Fa, la, sol, fa, mi, re, what we would now call a Dorian cadence or, or anyway, a minor cadence. But here's the cool thing. Anybody looking at this from about 1400 onward would take a look at that melody and they would be able to improvise another melody at sight. And they called it sighting in England. And what they would do is they take a look at the yum, bum, 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 and they would just visualize a third below. So they go bum, 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 bum. If the cadence were bum, 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 and end, bum, at the, at the unison. If they were men and boys, and sorry ladies, a lot of this was men and boys in choirs, but also women did it too. But the point was, if you were with an older person and a younger person, the younger person would sight read a third below, but it would actually come out a fifth higher. And so this would be what you would get. Um, these are both in the same octave. By the time you get 1600, nobody cares what octave it's in. But here's the cool thing, is that once you did this, you could also improvise a third voice. 
And the way you did that was you get that person who says, I, I can't sing in tune. And actually the reason they say that is because they're actually like in an alto range and they automatically just go to parallel fifths. And what you do is you read the top melody, you, you visualize it exactly the same way, but you sing a third lower. And that's the origin of one of the most simple forms of, of counterpoint is fa burden or fa burden. I'm gonna play you all three of these now, just to get you settled in here. voices. Well, just to give you a little too much information, at this period, people probably would have not said D, C, B flat, A. They would have said La, Sol, Fa, Mi, which would make it even easier for somebody to think a third lower. La, Fa, La, Sol, or Fa, Mi, Re, Ut, Fa, Mi, Re, Ut. They could just think right below it, the third. So this happened, it was common until about 1450. And gradually from 1450, something happened, this middle voice dropped below the tenor voice. So we still have those same, here's that original melody. Bum, 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 and the top melody above it. But below now, they started doing three below, five below, three below, five below, three below, five below, three, five, either one or another fifth, et cetera. And this starts around 1450. By 1475, you see this as a standard kind of way of doing a, a cadence or a close, a clausula. And it avoids parallel, parallel fifths. And that's one of the cool things about it. Um, once you start doing this, the guy in the, this, this doing this voice in the middle was called the tenor. He held the melody. The person above was called the cantus or in, uh, gradually the sopra, the soprano, right? The voice below was called the contratenor. It was below, it was against the tenor. But once they had this idea that the, the, that contratenor dropped low, five, three, five, three, five below, then they had a new idea, which was, hey, we have space for a fourth voice. And so if you look here, this fourth voice, which they also called the contratenor, and then there was confusion. So they said, which contratenor are you doing today? And he says, I'm doing the contratenor basso. Okay, I'm going to do the contratenor alto. So that's where you get soprano, alto, tenor, bass. They're not voice ranges. They're actually, um, well, yeah, contrapuntal functions. So here's three voice. Both of these are typical for something from 1475 to up until 1700, except for one thing, this F sharp would have not been around in 1475. Yes, at the cadential figure here, this B natural is something we see starting around 1550, 60 or something like that. Okay, um, so this soprano alto tenor bass, this function exists very clearly in composed counterpoint by about 1475. But by 1500, people are saying, hey, that's the way to end a phrase, but let's use it for making songs. So if I want to like use this pattern, I'm a beautiful humanist and I think, well, I'd like to really sing gorgeous text. I can actually use this pattern and make up words. I can go, today I went into the store and thought I'd buy some cheese. They said there isn't any more, buy something else, please. You get the idea, I'm a beautiful songwriter. But you can do any kinds of melodies and any kind of rhythms with these chord progressions, strophic song, all sorts of stuff. So, so something is, so here's basically Passamezzo, they called it Romanesco because it's the Roman um, progression. It also became the pattern, which is green sleeves. So if you'll bear with me, if you see my cursor, alas, my love, you do me wrong, do bum bum ba ba da bim ba dum, rum ba da bi di dum ba da ba da bim ba dum ba da dum, rum ba da da dum ba da ba da dum ba da ba da dum bum bum. So you get the idea that's basically green sleeves and a gazillion other things. It's not only green sleeves, it's la scatola, which survives in a, uh, in a 
sonata with variations over La Scatola um, by Marco Uccellini. We'll see that at the very end of the PowerPoint presentation, a link to that. But this is a kind of a slightly blue song. You get the idea. And then goddesses in England is not exactly green sleeves. It's more like that antico pattern because it doesn't have that three, five, three, five. It goes one, so they boom, boom. And that's actually typical to older English music and to Irish music as well. So some pieces have this and some pieces have this. Some start with the third and some start with just the G minor chord in this case. Um, that's a typical sort of substitution. You'll hear this in Irish music. And that's goddesses. Paul Steeple is another variant. And here's the cool thing. If somebody saw a melody with a pattern like Greensleeves in it, and here's Hatikva, they just stick the bass chords, the progressions of Greensleeves in there. And that's one of the most important things. They originally did not think of these as chord progressions. They were melodic progressions with contrapuntal functions. So for throughout this whole period, if somebody saw a melody, they could see the three other voices in their head. If somebody saw a bass, they could see the three other voices in their head. For that matter, if somebody saw bum, 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 an alto function, they could add three other voices. And so it's sort of a mixture of a oral and and visual grid people have in their head for doing this. And so it's both melody and it's also chord progressions. Um, but it didn't originally start as chords, it started as counterpoint. So here's where we do the part I do in class, which is how do you improvise over your ground? And this is based on 17th century rules for how to do this. But the first thing you do is, and I'll do this normally in a circle in class, so you get the idea, is you pick a melody. For starters, you do something they hardly ever actually did you pick one melody for chord. So I could go bum, 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 bum. But I, I could also go yum, ba, dum, ba, dim, ba, dum, or lum, bum, 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 bum. You get the idea? I can draw a line from any melody to any other melody. Most of these people were not just doing one note over the chord, but for starters, this is actually one of those things where we work with this just to find out what our limitations are. For instance, I can't do parallel fifths against the bass. So I can go bum, 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 because if you see here, those are all, will create parallel fifths. So that's one thing is to figure out which melodies work. So that's your first thing is to pick a melody, visualize a melody, and you notice this is actually how people learned counterpoint as well. They draw all the possible notes and they draw lines between the ones they wanted to do. All right, so far so good. Uh, David, we have any urging questions here? Uh, no, right now we're, we're, okay. we're free of questions. Okay, good. So that's my first step is choose your ground. Your ground is whatever melody you choose, you can change as you go along. And by the way, if you're improvising, this is the coolest thing when somebody is going wiggle 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 playing all sorts of 16th notes. If you're nervous, you can always play just the first four notes and you're still improvising. You can get away with lots and a little bit of attitude. Um, the other thing you can do is remember that also rests are part of the ground. I can go yum, rest, wall, rest. That's also a melody, right? Um, now, the next thing we do when we're thinking about making improvisations or variations of our ground, What's the first thing we have to do? Raise your hand if you know. Well, you can't really, right? Um, the first thing you have to do, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll dispense with the making my classroom students on the webinar wiggle, is to break the rhythms. In order to play any extra notes, I have to have rhythms. So here's a list, if you see in front of you, of just sort of standard rhythmic patterns that people would use. You could go yum, ba dum bum be dum bum bum ba dum bum bum you get the idea, or yabam ba da dum 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 ba da dum. This is one of this is a Telemann favorite thing. After you heard all of those um, fiddle players from the German part of the Czech Republic from Silesia, that's kind of a typical fiddle player thing. But what if I want to do Ortiz? Dum bum ba bum ba bum ba bum 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 ba bum ba. Typical Renaissance syncopated over the chord. How about if I want to do a saraban? Yum bum ba dum bum. Yum bum 
you get the idea. All of these things are possible, but so far we're picking one melody per chord. So one melody note and we're breaking up rhythms. You might notice something. I do something on the first measure and something different on the second measure. Then I do the third measure the same way as the first measure and then the fourth measure. This is pretty typical. It may seem very classically balanced, but it has something to do with the fact that you're going three below, five below, three below, five below. People tend to think of these paired of measures. They tended to think of these in a pair. Also, often, the first measure lifts up in a dance, and the second measure, you bow or do your reverence. They call this arsis and thesis. So even in Melody of Green sings, yum, ba bing, bum, down we go, up we lift and down we go. So you'll see a lot of thinking of the me melodies in pairs of measures because whatever happens in one and two actually happens quarterly in three and four, just a third lower. Okay, so far you get the idea. I could go, yadam ba da ba da ba dum da dum da yaba ba da ba da ba dum da dum dum. I need to do any of these things before I can actually add more notes. If I want to add a second pitch to measure one, I'm going to need a rhythm. So this is one of the first things we do. You can use rhythms of text, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so far so good. Yes, David. Are you notice even by the way this group of yop yambada yambada bada bada bomb that group over the ya ha 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 if I'm a bad singer I can do that but I go yum bidi 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 bomb later if I want to add notes I still need that rhythm okay here we go next my next step is not in the official rule book but it's break your octaves and I think this is a really important restriction to practice because breaking your octave tells you what you can and can't do watch this I can go Oops, deep. Oh, I can't get down low. So I have to go. That sort of thing. Now, that's pretty darn boring. So if you want to be a little more Baroque about this and a little more following the rules, if you look at section B, yum, bum, bum, ya, dum, bum, bum, ya, dum. That way I'm following a rule where you start and end a measure with the main note. And then you see there's a little voice leading here instead of wang cha, wang cha, come ya, dum, bum, ya, dum, ya, dum, be dum. But if I want to be a little bit like a Vivaldi, you get the idea. But if I go, and you see that in the bass version as well. This is very typical of Baroque music to see this. I call this the um, Popeye Sailors. That's two notes in the middle. It's really typical of Baroque music to have something that happens one, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three. Okay. One of the reasons the octave is so cool to know how to use is because I could say this. That's interesting. What if I go? We get the idea it's a little more Baroque sounding. Okay, so this is the, the second step is, well, the third step, take your melody, then the, the second step is break the rhythms, pick rhythms that you can just do off the, you know, at the drop of a hat that you are comfortable with, and then build, find it well where your octaves are good. These are all the boring ones. Whenever I do this in class, I'll tell somebody to do this, and inevitably somebody will go, And I say, no, 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 just keep yourself strict. And it's not because I want you to be boring. It's just to say, well, there is this idea that in restriction is great creativity. Uh, necessity is the mother of art, I think is the Latin term, but let's go on. Um, the next step is to break the chords. And this is a really the cool moment. If you can see those chords in your head, so bum, 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 as I just pointed out on the cursor, if I can visualize them in my head as I play, And I've got also, I'm really starting to take off at this improvisation airplane. Now, if you notice what I said about measure one and measure two, if I do exactly the same thing in measure one and then in measure two, even though they're both root position chords, I'm gonna cause a crunch melodically. You see this seventh I'm circling? If I just do this, seventh chords are okay now, but contrapuntally, that's a no-no. And this is, I think the clearest example of getting to realize that measure one has something different at measure two. And so here's my corrected version.
So if you can hear the difference that one and three work the same way and two and four work the same way. And that's always a good thing to remember. But if you look here, arpeggiated fat, yum, beep, 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 It's still underlying a melody. You guys have always remember, I know I know you've heard, circle your main notes when you're working on your sonata. Well, here they are, right? Okay, you can also do it as a slip jig, which is a jig in 9-8, yup, beep, 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 or as a saraban. Now in the classroom, I always have somebody playing along the bass with these examples. And so, yum, bum, 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 bum. This is maybe, some people do this and some don't, but I can actually see that bass progression on the staff line, even if it's not there, I visualize it there. Okay, you can see something special about basses, and this is even more particular in Baroque music, which is if you look right here, a bass, if it's under everybody, it can't go because that F will be a fourth unsupported. So you hear a lot of bass. That's a really typical bass, yum, bum, 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 because that's something a bass can do without causing a, a, a fourth under the other voices. That's a strict rule, but that's just something you know bass players can't do things other guys can do. Okay. Here's another, just the second half of that page of a few examples. Um, now, here is the next step is filling in the ground. Filling in the ground, we've, we've, we've taken our melody of ground, we've broken up all the possible rhythms we can ima possibly imagine. By the way, you're playing along with somebody and then the next step you go to octaves, you're getting nervous, you can always go back to playing just the main four notes if you want to, take a rest for a measure. Um, then the next step, playing the chords. Let me just go back to this because what other thing I wanted to say is you could do this style of improvisation with because this is based on all consonant notes over the chords, right? You could do this with a thousand people in a room and it would still be consonant and still work. So I have an imagination that there is a room in heaven where there are millions of angels improvising to green sleeves in this style. If you don't like green sleeve, there's probably a room in hell where there are millions of demons improvising over green sleeves with all consonances. But there might be one where they're doing only dissonances more likely. Now, here's the next step is to fill in the ground. That means filling in those chords. So if, I, if I'm doing strict consonances, is the next step. There's something I wanted to tell you more also about this idea of chords, and I'm sorry to go back like, but is that that next idea of why octaves can be so important even this late in the game is because if you say my last couple of chords right here, wom, bom, 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 listen to the difference between Mickey Mouse and fancy Baroque music. And you get the idea, okay. So filling in the ground means I can have passing dissonances and neighboring dissonances. So yum, bum, bum, ya, ba, be, bum, be, da, ba, da, bum, bum. And all of those during, throughout the 17th century, all the way through the period in which Bach was trained, people said, well, you know, the main, anything can be boiled down to its consonant notes. Everything else is an ornament. So even if it's composed, it's actually an ornament. So green sleeves, you see one, one of the standard versions of green sleeves in English books is all consonant. But a more common version is and then you know the still outlining the basic things. Um, I've given you uh, standard kind of versions of green sleeves here, but you can see here, here's the passing note. The C and the A and the F and the A are all consonant. Ya bom bi da bo do bom are the passing dissonances. Um, if you look at the Baroque divisions I have in section B here, la bo da bo di bo di ba ding, you see that little moment, ya dum ba da bo da dum ba da bo da bo di bo dum ba dum da bo da bo dum bum bum. It's a cool thing in Baroque music is look for the last note of the bar leading to the next note of the first, the next bar. Always a cool like little tip off of something. 
I gave you here Renaissance syncopations. I put Renaissance in quotes. These are sort of designed based on Diego Ortiz's variations. The idea that you get to this, wait, wait a second, this F is consonant with the first B flat chord and with the F chord. So this style of variations is based on using consonant progressions over, over a, over a cha chord change. And again, by, at the bottom, standard bass variations. If you look down here where my cursor is going in the first measure, I'm going, that's really just yum, bum, 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 ya, ba, bum, 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 ya, ba, da, ba, da, ba, di, ya, ba, da, ba, di, ba, di, ba, da. But they really are still outlining the bum, bum, bum. Because those are the kind of two notes you can play in the bass in that chord. You can't go yum, bum, bum, unless there's somebody underneath you. Any questions along the way so far? I'm going uh, no questions. Occasionally, just so you know, okay, occasionally uh, some of the upper pitches uh, cause the microphone to limit, uh, and so the the sound is dipping. And yeah. I don't know if I don't know if uh, okay there's much we can do about that. That's all right. You know, my my great aunt didn't like soprano recorder either. So um, uh, okay, so. Um, I wonder, I'm gonna just skip back a few if you don't mind. And let's go kind of back to the beginning a little bit and let's look at green sleeves. One thing I didn't do on this, but is on the power, is on the um, finale and Sibelius and XML files I put up for you guys, is that something people did throughout the Renaissance is to use the idea of making every note a quarter note. So here I can go, Instead of yeah, to go bum 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 bum, and they'd actually write out each note. They call it tick notation. That's a way of letting you giving you kind of a scaffolding. If go yum bum bum bum. So can you guys? Well, I'm going to do this. Just try this with yourself. You see my chord. I'm bum 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 bum. Bum 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 bum. You see how chords two and four are in the same position? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna sing along. Are you guys ready? I want you to pick any of this chord, and I'm gonna go give tick notation in the tenor voice once. And I'm gonna have you kind of sing along and see if you can sing anything. Just try consonants, okay? One, two, three, four. Just like the old cartoons. Now I'm going to try the bass. Boom. Okay. One, two, three, four. Bum 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 David, would you like to try something with me? Sure. Let's see if this works, okay? What I'd like you to do, David, can you sing the bass for me? Uh -huh. Can you do it for me in tick notation? Bum, bum, bum. And what I'm going to uh -huh. do for people is I'm going to sing the top voice and the third voice, as I'm pointing to these, as bum, 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 bum. Okay. Bum, two, three, four. Bum, 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 bum. You get the idea? Let's do that one more time because now I'm going to fill those in. One, two, three, four. Great. Okay, cool. I know there's a little time lag there, but I hope you get the idea. It's pretty easy to go from bum, 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 bubble, 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 bum, bubble, 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 bum, and then the sky's limit. Or lum, bubble, lum, bada, dum, bada, dum, bada, dum, bada, dum, bada, dum, bada, dum, bum. You get the idea? All right, cool.
So those are basically the rules. Let's just go through them one more time. Choose a melody. First, get some patterns you're comfortable with. By the way, if you look at B, dum ba da dum ba da dum ba da dum bum, that's the, um, you're riding the horse, you know, the, um, that's actually associated with being joyful and elated in Baroque music. It's called the figura corta, yum ba da dum ba da dum. So that's a little cool thing to know. And if you want to do a variation that's exciting, you don't have to do tons of notes. I can go, You get the idea. I can do pretty simple melodies and get some excitement out of it. Then I want to have my octaves ready so I can play like Vivaldi. And then here's where it gets really interesting. How many ways can I find from going through chords and making tons of melodies entirely consonant? And then finally, filling in those passing and neighboring dissonances. Wait, I said finally, there's another rule. It's called break the rules. And the break the rules is where you say, okay, let's break the rules in a number of ways. The first way that everybody throughout the Renaissance and the Baroque period broke the rules, quote unquote, is that they would, here we have, if you notice, these melodies are third apart, they're actually a sixth apart also, is to hold that sixth, that note, while this note goes down in the tenor and create a suspension. If you look at that, you don't need that B flat at the beginning of the measure. I could have just gone to the A right away. And that's what a suspension is. It's holding a note too long to get to its resolution. And so this is a standard thing that everybody does at the end of phrases in, in Baroque music, but actually they saw it as an ornament. It was a rhetorical figure because it adds something. If you notice, I could go bum, 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 yum, bum, bum, but here's yum, bum, pee, dum, bum, bum, pee, dum. And that creates the suspension, the dissonance that needs to be solved. This note, the C, going down on that B flat was called the agent because it's acting on that B flat. And that B flat is the patient. It's the one that feels the passion and has to be cured. And so you see this way I've treated this as a set of, of, of just suspension exercise. This next one I call size and birds, and this is goofy. But first of all, you can do things like imitate animals. Yum, bum, 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 bum. You get the idea, cuckoos. But here, I could just keep going and holding a note. And this is kind of something you'll hear in operas. Oh, I'm so sad, I am a bird that's really sad. Dee -dum, dee -dum, dee -dum. It's gonna cause crunches. I'll play both of these for you now, and they sound a little goofy, but you'll get the idea. Okay, in all fairness, those two at the bottom are not supposed to be played at the same time, but my finale file forgot to remind me that. But you see, you can also break rules by doing things, as I said, suspensions are considered rhetorical ornaments, and you can do them places. There's another one I um, didn't put here, but you'll hear in a minute, which is the idea of chromatics. I could go yum, ba dum, bum, A, A flat, G, because contrapuntally, that A over the C is the same thing as an A flat, that's just a color of it, a chromatic is a color and that adds emotion as well. So I'm gonna show you now um, three variations over green sleeves I did just for, to give an example. The first one is yum, bum, 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 standard. The second one, I've actually started treating it more contrapuntally with suspensions and treating the bass itself as a melodic pattern, sort of more like three contrapuntal voices. And the third one is goofy, it has chromatics. And I'm gonna give you a little funny term. If you look, if you did any chromatic, if I go yum, pom, 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 but yum, pom, 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 that passage in Baroque rhetoric was called, um, first of it was called pathopoeia, meaning added pathos. Chromatics just make you feel more. Actually back then they also said so they're a little more girly because girls feel more passion, but that's not politically correct anymore. But often when a guy meets a girl, he suddenly starts singing in chromatics. That's a typical thing in Baroque period because he feels more passion. But another one, if you want to, if you want to be sad, you can go yum, bum, bum, bum. But what if I really want to be sad? I can do a passus durius meaning a really difficult steps. 
That's what my third variation will do, but it's goofy. So here we go, three variations over green sleeves. And by the way, the master of doing this, unlike me, is Henry Purcell. Henry Purcell would take grounds and re redefine them. Here, my F is a, the root of a chord, but Henry Purcell could make it the third of a D flat chord if he wanted to. So all kinds of things. So there's certainly room for that. Um, great. Uh, any questions still? No, it looks like we're okay. Okay. So um, I'm used to having people in class. Hey, guess what? I said we were doing Romanesca, that's green sleeves, but actually if you look at La Folia, La Folia actually has, look at this, yum, bum, bum, bum. The second group of four notes of Folia is just Romanesca. The first half of Romanesca. And then you go back again and the second time, yum, bum, 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 bum. So Folia actually has the first half of Romanesca in it, its first time around, and then the second half of Romanesca in its second time around. Here's another cool thing about folia. Folia itself is yum pom 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 pom. And if you notice when it goes up, it does the opposite. Bing pom pom pom. But if you go backwards, pom 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 pom. And so actually folia is a really cool thing. It's a palindrome where the Romanesca happens goes three below, five below, three below, five below, but following backwards, backwards, three below, five below, three below, five below. So it's really just a rising fifth all the way down and a rising fifth all the way down again. It happens to have Romanesca in the middle. You might know this more typically in triple and you might recognize the second melody more, which is yum pom, ba dum 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 Yum pom ba dum 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 pom pom. Sometimes you'll get yum pom pom and bum pom pom. Well, you'll create that suspension there. That's typical. Um, so that's actually La Folia is just a palindrome with green sleeves at its two centers. If that makes any sense. Um, and green sleeves backwards is the beginning. So. The next thing is, that so far, we've been doing Romanesca is all actually in, in a, a minor key, a mall key. But actually, we also have examples from 1540 of pieces in major. And a passamezzo, again, was just a dance step. In the, in the beginning, they just called it passamezzo. And then they made a distinction between, oh, the modern one and the old one. So this, the modern one, yum, da dum 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 da dum da yum ba dum ba dum it doesn't work with the three below, five below, because a B natural to it under this, going to an F below, is weird. So you actually start seeing them do really what we call harmonic. One, one chord, four chord, one chord, five chord, one chord, four chord, one, five, one. You get the idea there. And they call this the Moderno. It's also Buffins, if you know the Van Eyck. I'm not going to do that for you guys all, but that's basically the same chord progression. So this around 1540 shows up and it starts being called Moderno, Buffins, different kinds of things. The Canario is also yum, ba dum pum, ba dum bi da dum pum pum ba bum ba bum ba bum one four five one. It's just the second half of that. But let's take a little step backwards and go back to explain where this idea of minor and major or mall and door comes from. 
And that comes, oh, by the way, here are melodies associated with the, um, the moderno pattern in, in major chord progressions, minario, ballo inglese, lili burlero, yum ba dum bum. Also, John, come kiss me now, and buffon, so they buffon. Well, let's take a look at where this kind of all comes back at 1500. The first piece we have that is actually a passamezzo is called Caminata. It's from around 1500. And if you look, the top voice goes, yabba da ba dum pom, yum ba da ba da ba da bum, yabba da ba dum pom, bum ba dee bee dum. Now, if you notice, under the line here, it's A, G, F, E, A, G, F, E, F, and over here, the tenor, C, B flat, A, G, C, B flat, A, G, F. Look at the bass, yum, bum, 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 beep, bum, 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 right? So the problem here is you notice, why is this yabba da ba dum? It's avoiding parallel fists. Instead of yum, bum, is yum, bum, bum. So there is a built-in problem in this old passamezzo pattern. And so they have to do things to avoid those parallel fits between measure one and two. Um, by the way, you might notice this is typical also of old passamezzi. They have a refrain pattern that's just to close. This goes yum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, 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 lum, ba dum, beam, ba da ba da ba dum, bum, bum, bum. And I like to tell people this is actually very close related to in te domine speravi, yum, bum, bum, bum. It's just against in te domine speravi opening minus a measure or two there. Yum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, 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 ba, bum. But if you see this pattern, yum, yum, bum, bum, bum. If you're an Irish music fan, you might ya ba da ba dum ba, ya ba da ba dum da, ya ba da ba dum da, ya ba da ba dum bum. It has an older feeling now. And they, by the time they did the passamezzo, when this was around, they just called it a passamezzo. They didn't need to make a distinction. Why? Because if you do it in minor, and this is my imagination of this, it just, it just, you take it up a step. Yum, pom, 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 ki, dum, pom. Yabba, da, ba, dum, pom, 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 bi, di, di, bi, di, bi, dum, pom, 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 bi, di, bi, pom. It's the same issue, and it's got the same, it basically sounds the same, and it has the same issues. Romanesca, by making that a three below to a five below, solves those issues. And here's the cool thing, is if you have it major, what we call major, or minor, it makes no distinction when you're using this one. By the way, even the solfege of the bass is the same. This is sol, 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 fa, sol, sol, re. And over here, sol, sol, fa, sol, sol, re. They made no distinction. But once they start fixing that issue, then Romanesca becomes called the Romanesca. It's different than the Antico pattern. The old pattern, they started to call that one that didn't have the three, five, three, five below. And then the Moderno, oops, sorry. Yep. The Moderno, they called the Moderno because it was yet again different. On guitar players and other people, they'd say, look, if I'm doing the Moderno here, I'm doing it with a hard B, a B natural. So I call it Dur for my Dur chord. If I'm flattening the notes, it becomes Romanesca. I call it a Maul mode. So that's the origin of our major and minor. It's originally, it was just a practical thing of, well, am I doing a B flat today, George, or am I doing a B natural? Am I doing a hard B or a, or a soft B? So that's just a little bit of too much information, insight in the background. And then I just thought I'd share with you, um, I have a series of readings here that might be of use. Um, th these are not the only ones, and I'm not, not tooting my horn here, but this, this whole presentation actually is closely related to an article I wrote um, it's not called hands-on musicology. It's called Th Thunder and Tune the Green Sleeves. Um, I'll fix that for you. Richard Hudson. If anybody's interested in this, you've got to go read Richard Hudson. His folia dance. Uh, um, and think, but here, his really cool thing is he has a series of um, f three volumes, four volumes. Called, one's called the folia. The other's called the saraban. The other's called the pasacalla and the chacon. If you're in a university library, you will find these under uh, M2H for Hudson. But um, these are great. They collect a bunch of them. If you're interested in doing this, you know, use Diego Ortiz, Tratado de Glossas. I first started doing this by discovering Michael Pretorius's Terpsichore. If you know the Spanish Pavan, Yabadam, Bim, Pom, Pom, actually has diminutions written. And that's a ground-based progression as well. 
Um, another great reference is the um, division vial. Um, there's a beautiful article by John Wendland about La Monica, which is the tune that is um, yum pum pum pi da di dum ba da da dum bum ba da dum. It's also the major version of that is ding dong merrily on high. I've got down here also, uh, I think that what you'll see on your internet is fixed from this. I have one also John Walsh, the division flute from 1706. And here's where we get to an important resource, IMSLP. You can look up Marco, Marco Uccellini. Almost all of Marco Uccellini's trio sonatas are based on tunes that are ground-based tunes. That's also the same for his teacher, Giovanna Baptista Buonamente. John Walsh's division flute is a really great resource with examples of tunes. It's from 1706. All of these, even though they are in facsimile, they're quite legible. The John Walsh is easily re readable. You can get Diego Ortiz's Trattato. You can get pieces by Simpson. Gasparo Zanetti did a treatise for violins called Il Scolaro, and a lot of those tunes are based on, on, uh, on, 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 on tunes that are ground-based progressions. Jakob van Eyck is known for his diminutions, but knowing how to do diminutions, that's the second way I got involved in this myself, is a great way of knowing how to look at that melody in green sleeves and make diminutions over, get from one note to another. That's another, that's a whole topic for another webinar one day. Um, Playfords, and here's where the next thing I wanted to say that, I, if you remember, I mentioned that anybody would see a tune, they would also see the other melodies. So every tune from the Renaissance had potential fragments of bass patterns. And by the way, people like Bach happened to just use them for modulation right and left. But so, Great example, you can find lots of tunes from Jakob van Eyck's Ruth Grafoon Bach. Has, Bach Grafoon has great um, examples for that. Um, Ross Duffin's Shakespeare songbook. Uh, Caroso, the Il Ballerino, these are also great tunes. Look right down here, Florimond van Dauza hit Alder Nederland's lead. It's all in Dutch, but it's three volumes of tons of tunes gathered from the period. This is from 1903 to 1908. You can get it on Google Books. It's a special resource. And as we go down the list, I'm just going to show you Claude Simpson, the British broadside ballad and its music. This is the book that got me into musicology. I held it from the library overdue so long. My mother ordered it for me when I was 13. And it's got all these great tunes in it. And Ross Stephan's Shakespeare songbook as well. A lot of these tunes are associated with grounds. Um, Greensleeves, by the way, was used as a litany for singing church. You could add text to it and used for so many nasty, vicious political ballads. I'm sure we could do that today nowadays as well. So... I'm gonna flip this and ask if there are any questions now. We have uh, just one from a little bit earlier oh, nice. um, when when someone asked uh, what the the difference or maybe connection with La Folia and the uh, Chaconia, if there if there uh, is. That's a great question. So you know the Chacon pattern. Let me take you to the Chacon pattern. Um, the Chacon pattern is. I'll find this. Let's see. Back to the very beginning. The Chacon is actually, um, originally, the first Chacons were really simple, but they're really just yum, ba dum bum bum ba dum bum bum ba dum bum bum dum ba da beam. So it's three below, five below, three below, five. So the first, the first four chords of the Chacon are like the Romanesca. It's also, you may know this as the Aria del Gran Duca, yum, bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 bum. That's the Ariga del Gran Duca from the 1589 wedding ceremony in Florence. And it's also in um, the Lara Suave in, um, in the Airs and Ancient Dances of Respighi. So the, or, the relationship between that is you see that all of these are kind of intertwined. The, the, the Pasacalia, yum, bum, bum, bum. But it could go also go, Beam, bum, bum, bum. But yum, bum, bum, bum. That is the Pasacalia is now in the melody with three, five, three below, five below. Now, you could do this, and this is sometimes people say, well, that Chacon doesn't sound like box Chacon. Well, and if you look at Richard Hudson's book, Chacon and Pasacalia, the terms are almost in interchangeable in the early versions. And always through things are, their, the terminologies are messy. And so I can go yum, da dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, bum, ba dum, bum, bum, and call it a pasacalia, but I can also call it a chacona. But the original chacones were typically in a major key. Yum, ba da 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 dum, ba da 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 dum, ba da 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 dum. Sorry. 
Maybe I can show you. Do you have a little patience for a a, a patience for a, a chacon? I'll just show you very quickly. I did a let's see. Can you see my screen? David? Uh, I can just, we see right now just your power, your, uh, your keynote. Okay, so. Um, you just need me, to reshare re whichever screen you would like to share. Okay, let me then reshare. Uh, how do I reshare? New share, and I'm gonna share now with you my desktop. Cool. Can you see now a Chacon here in front of you? Yes. Okay. So this is a chacon that, um, if you look here, it's bum. Uh, it's uh, a little bit bigger. Bum. Three below. Five below. Three below. Five below. Four. Five. One. That's the standard chacon. Like I said, it's. It could also be yum bum bum bum. It could be in minor, all kinds of things. But uh, overhead, it's yum bum 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 bum. If I play a little bit of that, let's see if you can hear this. This is just a series of variations I did based on in the style of Uccellini, basically. And just to give you an idea, this is how the chacon sounds. But you notice the first four chords are basically the Romanesca. And so that's why the, the terminology gets messy. Let's see if this works. Okay. The other thing is associated with the Chacon is that syncopated rhythm that is considered sort of South American-y, uh, New world So many Chacons actually start on the offbeat. That may have something to do actually with two things, with dancing styles and with percussion styles, because we think of the percussion being on beat, boom, chadom, chom. But a lot of South American percussion starts go chom, prr, bom, prr, bom, prr, and this accents happen on the upbeat where somebody lifts as well. Did that answer the question too long away? Yes. I think we're all right. Great. Any other questions? Uh, we don't have any other right now. Uh, if anyone has any questions, this is probably the, the best time to ask them. Well, let me say this, uh, I would, I, and David's been there. The really cool thing about this, you can be in a room with the best musicians, flashy, fancy, everything all over the place, and the person who can play four notes, and they can both improvise over green sleeves together. Because if mm -hmm. you, once you know those four notes, you know a couple of licks, you can always get some mileage out of it. Um, I put on, um, I shared with David, and I'm sure you guys can get to it, he'll make it available. In addition to this, as a keynote and a PowerPoint and a PDF, this presentation, I have, um, I have a, a, a document on Finale, XML, and Sibelius that is the different builds, you know, the, the one voice, the two voice, three voices, and forward on, all that stuff on there so you can use it. Um, if you're cleverer than I am, you can create a pattern, uh, take one of those and turn it into an endless loop and improvise over it as well. Mm -hmm. And I just shared in the chat, um, if you open your chat menu, if you haven't seen that, uh, there have been some folks who have uh, asked of, uh, or have uh, asked for the links before, but the link to the files uh, that Adam has, has shared are there, as well as a link to uh, the, the uh, 
webinar playlist that we have on our YouTube channels that's there. Uh, we'll also send an email out to everyone who, uh, who registered for the webinar with those file links in them as well. So you can have multiple opportunities to, to get the, the music and all of the slides and everything. Great. I'd like to say one more thing to, to Jacqueline about the difference between a folia and a chacona is that things, I said it before, but I'll say it in a different way. Things are messy. Something can be labeled different ways and one, two things can have the same name and one thing can have two names. But when you get to know them, if you look at the John Walsh, the melodies start to be like, um, they're all related. They're all cousins and brothers and sisters. But you know, if you have people in your family, one has a longer nose, you recognize them, one always wears a hat. Um, all the melodies could be almost, these chord progressions in some ways can be almost interchangeable. Some are more like others, but you start to get to know them as, oh, that has a different flavor. Then you go see it in a composition and that composer did something entirely different. All right, well, any, any, any last questions from anyone? Uh, we're seeing some, some thank yous. So, so we'll also say uh, thank you to everyone who has, uh, who has joined us this evening. Um, we offered the webinars every second Sunday of the month and then we'll archive those on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, and uh, coming up in January, the next one will be about practical professional uh, uh, tips, uh, traveling with instruments and obtaining uh, work visas and uh, taxes and all of those, all those fun parts of uh, being professional musicians. And that will be on the 12th of January. And we are working on the spring schedule for the webinars and the topics that will be discussed on those. Uh, and by spring, I mean February and beyond. And we will be sharing those on our website and through our weekly newsletter e-notes. Uh, I want to thank Adam uh, for being our presenter today and for taking us all through this, uh, this incredibly fascinating, uh, I guess you've already called it a family. So this family of, of musical styles and the way that we can uh, use all this information to, to create our own improvisation. So thank you so much, Adam. I want to thank you, and I'm going to just say, you guys, if you, um, you will, some of you will probably dream of those four notes in your sleep tonight. I'm, it, uh, it often happens, and you'll, I'm, I apologize in advance. And David, I want to thank you so much. You know, I'm, I, as a member of the board of EMA, one of the most things I've been wanting to do for the longest is to have um, tutorials and webinars and things. And uh, A, you and Karin are, and, uh, are making it happen. And, um, and all of you guys, the staff are wonderful, but you've, you're really making the machines work. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And if anyone has ideas uh, or things that you would like to see covered in the webinars, you can use the contact EMA form at earlymusicamerica.org. Uh, or you can also send me an email. Uh, my email is specialprojects at earlymusicamerica.org. And you can uh, email me directly there uh, if you have ideas that you would like to see for the webinars uh, at all. And I just put that email in the list. So uh, thank you once again, everyone, uh, for being here. We will have the archived version of this up in the next day or two. And uh, we will send a follow-up email uh, to everyone who participated with all of the files and the links to that as well. So uh, thank you once again to Adam, and thank you, everyone, for joining us.